had a teacher that was worn out this morning. My daughter, you know, she came in. Well, they left at 4 o'clock this morning. Well, Michael came in to pick her up. So yesterday was a family, like a whole family day. I was up at 4 o'clock in the morning then, stayed up all day, had a cookout, and we played games outside. I was playing two games at once. I don't know how I did that, but I was. They have wore me out, and I was up at the same time again this morning. So I am worn out, but it's a good worn out. But I'm prepared today, so we feel good. Um, it's good to have all the, my family in. I miss them when they leave, but Lord willing, we'll be here back in November and possibly December too. So I'm excited. So, I said, we'll see you in a little bit then. Lord willing. So, pass that around. I've had that typed up for a while. We'll mention it just briefly. But I want you to take that home, do whatever you want with it. But it has been... My scripture, we've talked about this scripture, Psalm 62, uh, in this series. And speaking of this series, a mighty God and an unyielding prayer warrior, we have, this will be our last lesson in this series. I'm pretty certain of it this time. I've said that like I think five times. But uh, we have explored our faith in an almighty God by examining the essence of acquiring mountain-moving faith. And when we... Uh, Face uh, life's battles, we must remember our position in a mighty God. We took to Psalm 62, which is the scripture that I just handed out, which is a prayer of David. Remember, we prayed that together and we uh, hopefully incorporated it into our prayer life, which reminded us that God is our salvation. He is the rock of our strength. He's our defense, our refuge. Our expectations come from God only. And that we do not place our trust in our oppression, but we place our trust in him at all times for power belongeth to God. I just love that scripture. Um, I still pray it. It's been something that's got me through this year. And so I wanted to remind us of that scripture. So put it on your fridge, put it in your wallet, whatever you want to do with it. I wanted to share that with you again as a reminder. So this study has led us. Um, to inventory of our prayer life, either either by opening or reshaping our prayer closets. Ultimately, we recognize the necessity of incorporating both prayer and fastings um, as an effective weapon against Satan, especially when he believes he's ensnared the child of God. Um, when desperate times calls for desperate measures, we incorporate fastings with our prayers to seek God. Uh, earnestly um, as an earnest appeal. So prayer and fasting will break, will break strongholds when an acceptable fast is offered before the Lord. We found many examples throughout the scriptures uh, of this. The Word of God teaches that an acceptable fast before the Lord must be rooted in humility, obedience, and sincerity of heart. So as we wrap up our series today, the book of Esther is where we're ending this series, and we are at the end of uh, the book of Esther, and uh, so I hope you've read through it. It's only 10 chapters short, and the 10th chapter, I think, is only like four or five scriptures itself, so it's very, very short, but it makes for a really good story, a true story, and it is the only book in the Bible, as we've mentioned before, that God is not mentioned, but he is very evident in it. Because that is who they're praying and fasting to. So, <clears throat> as um, so, we're uh, wrapping this up, and uh, uh, the book of Esther reveals that approaching God with a humble heart through prayer and fasting not only fosters obedience and courage, but it enhances our ability to discern the will of God in our lives, and the journey cultivates patience and leads us to a time of joy and celebration which is what the title of today's lesson is, is from prayer and fasting to joy and feasting. We get to eat, but we're eating spiritually here today. So that's where we're going to go. So we're going to turn to Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> we're going to begin there. We to told most of the story last week, but we want to see the ending here and how it wraps up. I'm going to do some reading for you because we want to explain a few things coming through here. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Esther 8, um, Esther had had her second banquet prepared for the king and Haman. 
Queen Esther then reveals Haman's devious plans before uh, the king. Remember, we talked about how uh, when he was routed out and the king went into the uh, garden and he came back and he found Haman groveling all over Queen Esther. <clears throat> that was enough to spark his interest and, and believe everything that Esther was saying, saying. So Haman now hangs from the very gallows that he prepared for Mordecai the Jew. Um, recently, the king realized that he had not adequately rewarded Mordecai for saving his life. We talked about that in the very beginning. Remember, there's these two uh, people that was going to seek the king's life. Mordecai found out about it, told Esther, and his life was spared. Well, the king did not know anything about this. So, on the day of the second banquet, that morning, the king could not sleep. So, the Lord woke him up. And the king said, go get me the chronicles, read me the chronicles. And in this, he found out that Mordecai has spared his life. And he's like, well, I didn't reward him. So perfect timing, because at the second banquet, that's when Haman's plan is uh, shown, and he's hung. And so additionally now, Haman's vacant position seemed perfect opportunity for the king to appoint Mordecai as in second in command. To the king. So the only one more higher than Mordecai is the king himself. So Mordecai has a lot of power here. And although Haman is dead, the threat of the Jewish people remain. We're going to talk about that. So as we jump into Esther 8, 3 and 6, what is Queen Esther's next move? Because the degree has went out, and just because Haman's dead, his signet ring still seals that decree. He cannot take back anything that he has sent out. So I want us to pay attention. And as many times I've studied the book of Esther, for the first time, I believe, I don't think I remember seeing this, I recognize something in this scripture that we're getting ready to read here in chapter 8 of verse 3. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears, to put away the mischief of Haman the Agite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther, so Esther arose and stood before the king. Here's what I noticed here. This is not, we talked about the first time that she came before the king and how if you are not, um, thank you, invited, to come before the king, that you can lose your life unless he holds out the golden scepter. Yeah. Well, here it just said she goes again uninvited. She wasn't called by the king. I've never noticed that before. Maybe you have, but I, I've never noticed that before. But she is asked again, or she wasn't asked. She went again before the king uninvited, and it says the king again held out the golden scepter. So I thought that. Also, we notice here that the first time that she came before the king, she came boldly. And in faith of God and for her people, but she didn't shed a tear then. She's shedding tears here today. I've noticed that also. So verse 5, and said, if this is Esther speaking to the king. And it and said, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of uh, Hamadatha, I can't hardly pronounce that, go for it. The Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come up to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? So what then is the king's response? So now he is going to respond to her, and we see this starting with Verse 7. Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther, the queen, and to Mordecai, the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hands upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you. In other words, he's given Mordecai permission to write whatever he wants. In the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. 
So here Mordecai calls the scribes in to write a counter degree of Haman's first degree. So we have two degrees going out, okay? Against the previous degree sent by Haman under the king's authority. So looking at verse 9, now let's, this is going to get a little confusing but with the dates and the months because we are looking at a Jewish calendar that's not related to ours, but I'll explain that to you, but let me read it first. So verse 9, then were the king's scribes called at the time in the third month, that is the month of Savan, and the, and the three and twentieth day thereof. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants, to the deputies, to the rulers of the provinces, which are from India to Ethiopia. And remember, there was 127 provinces. It says that here, remember when we first started Esther, there was 127 provinces. And to every province, according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, to the Jews according to their writing, and according to their language. And he wrote in King Ahasuerus' name, he sealed it with the king's ring, sent the letters by post on horseback, and riders of mules, camels, and young dromedaries. A dromedary is a type of camel that is, instead of uh, two humps, the camel has one hump, and they use these actually for racing or for delivering something very quickly. So dromedary is just a fancy name for a one hump camel that can go very fast. So looking at verse 11, here is what the degree that Mordecai sent out to counter degree, to counteract the other famous degree. Wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together, to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish all the power of the people and the provinces that would assault them, both little ones and women, to take spoil of them for prey. Upon one day in all the provinces, the king of Hazarus, namely upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. The copy of the writing for the commandment is to be given in every province, was published unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against the day to avenge themselves of their enemies. Almost done reading here. So the post that rode upon the mules and the camels went out, being hastened and pressed by the king's commandment, and the decree was written at Shushan, the palace. So here we see God is on the move. Once again, God's not mentioned, but he is plainly seen. He is on the move. God has intercepted Haman's evil plot to destroy the Jews. Notice how God has moved upon the heart of the king, who consistently finds favor upon Esther and her kindred. He put out a counter degree. He allowed Mordecai. He, you know, he permission is granted to send out the letters for this counter degree. And once, as mentioned, once a degree by the king is sealed, it can't be taken back. But you can send out a second ruling. And so that's what they're doing, okay? So they send out a second ruling. So with all these dates, I want us to get a time frame of how this is. Because this casting the lots is important for the very end of this book. Haman determined the day of destruction by casting lots in the month of Nisan, which is our April. So April of the year of 474 BC. So the day set for destruction of the Jewish nation in which the lots fell on was determined on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is called Adar, which is our March 7th which would be the year 473. So, you have March where he, uh, let's see, was that right? Yes, March, April, yes. So he cast out the lots uh, in April, and so March 7th, coming all the way back, for, that's almost a whole year to when the day of destruction is supposed to be. Well, it took almost two months, a little over two months, for Haman's decree to get out. 
Well, then now you have Mordecai who sends out his degree. And he sends it out. And that takes a little over two months. So if you take that and you subtract the, the time for the letters to get out, you have relatively about seven months left to prepare for battle. There you are, Nancy. I was like, where's Nancy today? I was starting to panic. I was like, what's wrong? She didn't tell me anything. So, okay, glad I'm happy here. But the casting of lots here, they did this a lot. Um, you see, uh, see this all through the Bible. And, of course, we don't do that now. We don't take things by chance. But I like what Proverbs 16.33 says. The law is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Nothing gets by God. He knows exactly what's happening, and he is in control of it all, especially when we depend on him, when we trust him for our next move. So God is moving on behalf of his people. God's favor is bestowed upon them. And so now there's this preparation for battle. The Persian Empire was massive. As we mentioned, 127 provinces uh, all combined. And so now you have about seven months to prepare for battle. And scriptures often, as it always does, lacks all the details that we want to know. We want to know every little detail, but they don't give us every little detail. If I was writing, it'd probably be in a lot of detail, but God knew better than that, so he said, you're going to get bored, so I like details. But we can attempt to fill in the blanks um, by just reading in between the lines. So it is uncertain if the Persian Jewish nation had any battle experience, but we can say that they probably more than likely went to battle. Um, it is likely that the Jews fought in the Cretan War. We talked about the Cretan War at the very beginning. Remember, he, the 127 promises, the king had brought a banquet, a drunken banquet, and he wanted to go uh, take over the Greeks and all this. And so that's why it's called the Cretan War. He didn't win that one, but he won the other ones. And so the Jews that was there, they remember they were captured. By their own doing, the Lord allowed them to go into captivity for 70 years. There was a remnant that went over to Jerusalem. They have to rebuild Jerusalem, but the ones that stay there are still under Persian control, but living, living freely. So the Jewish nation that remained, remained willingly. They could have went. They chose to stay. 70 years is a long time. You have a new generation that's raised in this culture. They have jobs there. It's a nice area. There's lots of gardens, lots of new things coming in, lots of money. It's a good income in Persia. And so um, it has become such secularized. And so after 70 plus years of living comfortably and spoiled, there's no threat that the Jews, if in battle with, with them, would turn on them. So there's no reason for that. You've got to remember, those living under the king's rule were at his disposal. Men were taken as units without choice. Women were taken to the king as wives and put in their ha his harem. Esther unwillingly was made queen. Mordecai became prime minister. And it is likely that many young men also fought the battles. However, those who had not fought now have approximately seven months to prepare for the battle. So even without prior experience, they still develop the spiritual skills they needed. And we've talked about that every lesson in the book of Esther. Their main thing is they went to prayer and fasting before the Lord. Started with Mordecai, the Jewish nation. Then Esther turned around and asked for the same thing. And he, she and her people did the same thing. So prayer and fasting. Also, Haman's uh, uh, ruling that went out against the Jews... We also got to think, now, I, I did a lot of study on this, and most scholars think that the one, the Jews that were in Jerusalem, that was still under the ruling of the Persian Empire at this time. So they also could have been the ones that were under Haman's attack, too. So it included all Jewish people in all the provinces that were scattered abroad. But God is on the scene. And his people, his prayer warriors, are praying to him and trusting in him. So now as we get down to uh, verse 15 of 8. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king 
and a royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of in the city of, and the city of Sushan rejoiced and was glad. Now wait a minute. The battle hasn't taken place. Nothing has been won yet. And they're rejoicing. And, and it says the Jews have light and gladness and joy and honor. Looking at verse 17. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast. And a good day. Now you talk about God on the move. I mean, this is their day of doom. And Mordecai walks out in all his apparel and they start rejoicing. And it says, and many of the people, I love this part, and many of the people of the land became Jews. <laughs> they won. Yeah, they're already winners, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. That was, I think that was my favorite part in all that. So here they are approaching the battle, and they utilized their spiritual resources. They sought God, uh, God's face for much prayer and fasting. They was joined in unity, one mind and one accord. They, they were obedient to whatever he asked. Um, they didn't move at Haman's scare tactics. It didn't threaten them. They just went right to their knees. Now I'll remind you, this was a this is a nation that's really forgotten God. And he's trying to get or they're trying to get his attention, but it's really God trying to get their attention. Hey, you need me more than you think you need me. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so they expected after prayer and fasting, they expected, they waited for God to move in their favor, and boy, did he. They are now trusting in God. The letters are out. The battle's still on. It's still raging. It still has to be fought. But there's joy for God's people. <coughs> in the midst of knowing that that battle is coming, said the Jews had light, gladness, joy, honor. You ever praise God before a battle? I know you have. I've watched you. I've watched you many times. Praise God before the battle. And if there's one thing we learn to do in our walk with the Lord is to praise God for the victory before the battle. Um, so joy for the battle. I want you to picture two enemies coming together, but the one, they just kind of have this smug thing like they know something that you don't know. And what is it they know? They, we know we win. That's how we are against the, the enemy. We know the end of the book. We know that we win. So we can always have that smug attitude with the enemy. We win. So as Christians, we find joy in our battle because we understand an important truth, and that is the enemy is already defeated. We've already won. The mentality of defeat represents fear, but a warrior's heart sees victory for the faith is grounded in God. And in that faith, joy is found. Because we have faith, we don't have that fear. Now, it's natural. If, if there's a battle coming, do I fear? Yes. But we don't stay there. We don't stay in that fear. It's important to reach for our faith in God. And joy provides that perseverance for the battle approaching. And we receive joy because we place our trust in God, which builds that confidence, which builds that assurance in God. Then that enables our hearts and our arms to be lifted in praise to God. That's how we're able to do that. That's joy for the battle. Because we have that assurance with God. Because he has proved himself time and time and time again. We're putting on the armor of God, as we've talked about a few times already, tapping into all of our spiritual resources, God's word, prayer, prayer and fasting when needed, faith, past experiences, obedience. That's what we're relying on. So, for what reasons were the Jews rejoicing? Well, they saw, as Bonnie just said, the downfall of their enemy. They knew they were already defeated. See, they took off 
your spiritual blinders of doubt and fear. And they open their hearts, their eyes and ears to the truth of God's word. This is the world today when it comes to God's word. That's, that's it. They close their ears, they close their eyes, they want nothing. They reject God's word. But here's a people that recognize they need God and they say, we're all in. You can have my heart, you can have my ears. I want to hear everything you have to say, God. I don't want to miss this point. And boy, this is a nation, they're ready to be demolished, Eddie. And they said, huh. so God has to get us so down before we start to look up, right? So the Jewish queen is now on the throne, pleading the case before the king. I'm, I'm telling you why they're rejoicing. So their queen is pleading the case before the king. Mordecai is now second in power to the king, and he sent out letters to intercept the first one. The king's favor is up on the Jewish nation, but more importantly, God's favor is up on the Jewish nation. Permission is to defend themselves against any who sought them hard. For the first time since the lots were cast, they have hope. Because I don't have time to read. 
read you everything, but I do want to point this out because we've been talking about prayer and fasting, what it brings us to. And so the Jews are destroying, the Jews destroy their enemies in all 127 provinces in honor and celebration and remembrance of how the Lord has preserved the nation and saved them from he Haman's evil plot. There is now another decree that goes out. And it is an annual feast that will be celebrated. This is called the Feast of Purim. And I meant to bring it, and I forgot to bring it. But I actually have, I think I brought it before, a scroll of Esther. And it's in a nice little wood case. And they still do this to this very day to remember what God did for his people way back yonder. And uh, it's called the Feast of Purim. And said the, the reason why it's called the Feast of Purim Pure and Babylonian name and Persian name actually means lot, the casting of lots. So this is a remembrance of Haman casting the lots and causing this day of dread. So they call it the Feast of Purim, but he didn't get his way. God got his way in the end. But if we look at chapter 9, looking at verse 27, I do want to read this to you. The Jews ordained, this is after their victory, after they won the battle, many were killed who were against them, but they had many on their side. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed, now there's their generations, and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. So every year they are to have this feast of Purim to remember what God has done in the days of Esther. And to this very day they still do this. Verse 28. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And that these days of Purim, the days of lots, that's what that means should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them that perished from their seed, their, their generation. And if we hop down to verse 31, I like what it says here. To confirm these days of Purim and the times appointed, according to Mordecai the Jew, and Esther the queen had enjoined, had enjoined them. And as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed, the matters of fasting and their cry. So this tells me here, this was the, I believe the last, is it the last one? Well, there's one more scripture after that. But this next to the last scripture uh, of chapter 9 that says, because of their prayer and fasting, this is how all this came about. Through their prayer. Isn't that awesome? Isn't this a good story? I just love this. It's a true story. And it's what God can do in our hearts. And I see that they're there at the door. They're rare to get in here. And that was perfect timing on my part. So I love you. I hope you enjoyed this. Pray for me. I don't know what God has for us next.